Thank you, John. Um, so uh, just before we, we start the, the discussion, um, I wanted to really um, thank uh, BELTA, the uh, Belgian um, English Language Teachers Association, um, which are, you know, without them, this series of webinars would, would have never happened. Um, they lent me the room and uh, um, they host the webinars. So um, thanks a lot to John and everybody else in, um, in BELTA. If you're in Belgium or passing around, they do um, um, yearly conferences, I think in, um, in April. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, and um, I've been to one, and it's it's a great conference. So uh, um, please go if you get a chance. And uh, yeah, um, I'll just uh, I'm really glad that Steve is here. And um, the reason I um, invited him is um, because um, well, originally um, we met during my Delta course in uh, in Budapest, and uh, he was uh, my Delta tutor um, for nine months. And, uh, and yeah, um, I know um, that Steve has a lot of experience in recruitment first. Um, you started off as a director of studies in IH Budapest, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, you're moderately mistaken. Should I, it, basically, I started out as a teacher in, I'll make it really short, in 1991 in Budapest. I came here from Japan and uh, became a teacher trainer sometime in the kind of early 90s, 93, 94, and it was later in the 90s when uh, I was basically acting director of studies for a year and a half because we didn't have a DOS, and uh, we kind of tried to manage without a DOS for a while, and it didn't work, needless to say, and finally I agreed to do it along with being head of teacher training, and I said I would do it for six months, and it lasted for 18, and I survived, but as a result, I had a lot of experience, a direct experience with recruitment. As head of teacher training, I've always had connections with recruitment since we, we recruit uh, from teacher training courses and also since I'm involved in recruiting senior people, trainers as well as directors of studies or assistant directors of studies. So that's the, the background. Right, as a trainer both on the CELTA and, and the DELTA, is that right? Only DELTA these days. Okay. I don't work on CELTA anymore. I haven't for a, a while. I mean, I'm in touch with it, but, you know, I, I stopped doing that. So DELTA and, uh, you know, in service conferences, this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and then you also um, you call out um, speak out series, right? Yeah, so I I am one of the four authors of Speak Out, which is I don't know if you people know it. It's a, a six level adult series published by Pearson, came out in two thousand eleven, and the second edition is coming out now, basically as we speak in these these months between now and. January, February, depending what country you're in. I think I can see Anna's in Poland. I think you can already get second edition in Poland. Um, Anna, sorry, if I can, sorry, Mertes, where, since a couple of people have joined, Anna, where are you in Poland? Because I know, we know we're a bit about Julian, Natalia, and Olena, and I can see that Andrea also joins. Yeah, it's in there. In Poland. So, Anna, if you type in that thing on the right, there's a place you can type in. And also, um, Andrea, where are you? in wherever you are. You could be Hungarian, theoretically. And then we've got Robert as well. Andreas typing. Oh, Andreas in Austria. OK, whereabouts? Whereabouts, OK. OK, OK. And Anna's not going to tell us where she is. That's OK. Anyway. Okay, um, so um, as you can see in the, in the middle, sort of below um, the cameras, um, the video, um, there is a box for questions. And uh, we're going to start off with um, recruitment. So if you have any questions um, regarding native and non-native speakers in recruitment, um, issues of equality, discrimination in your countries, um, please type them into the, to the box and uh, Steve will try to do his best to, to answer them as we as we go, um, but um, perhaps um, shall we um, kick it off with one question from me? Would that be all right, Steve? That would be fine. Fire away. Okay. Right. Um, so I, I often hear um, um, when I when I'm doing the, the work for Temple Equity, I often hear that um, you know it's the students that demand native speakers. That's why so many schools have to hire native speakers. 
Uh, what has your experience been like in, in Hungary? Maybe if you can tell us a little bit about the students there today. Um, really put so much emphasis on you know, the nativeness of the teacher or do they value other things? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, of course, it's a key question, an interesting one. It's, I wouldn't say um, a general yes. So I've heard students say, you know, I want a native English speaker teacher. I don't want to be taught by a Hungarian or, or whatever. So I've heard that. Uh, so from the, um, you know, the, the, from the point of view, if you ask students preference, um, generally, you, I mean, ask like that, you know, do you prefer native speakers? I think you're going to get yeses. But the way people answer that question when they're answering it theoretically and the way they answer it when they're basically in the context of being taught by this and that teacher. So particularly if you get a, you get a situation where students are in a group that's shared by two teachers, a native speaker and a non-native speaker. And it's something we did because taking into account that some students have a preference or, or a feeling about one or the other, because some students actually prefer being taught by a non-native speaker uh, because they may know their language gives them a security blanket. But anyway, if you have students taught by both and you ask them that question, you get a completely different um, kind of answer because students, when they're dealing with the concrete situation of the person teaching them and not this general concept of native and non-native, uh, they will choose the teacher who motivates them more and who they feel is more effective, uh, basically invariably, so that you know the, the, pre the prejudice and that's true of a lot of prejudices, isn't it? That you know, we all, we all, or those of us with our prejudices, we have them about a particular, you know, category of people. But then, when it comes to knowing somebody personally, or knowing some of them personally, whatever group it is, it's a completely different thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would agree. My, uh, my experience has been similar. I mean, I've never, I've never personally heard from. From a student or from my director of studies that you know, the students complained about my being Polish. Um, but so would, would you say that perhaps this question that I that I asked do most students prefer native speakers is a perhaps a wrong question to ask? Um, because as you said on the you know if you uh, ask anybody yeah would you like to have classes with a native speaker yeah. they'll probably say yes but but you ask them which teacher they want when they're actually being taught is different. Yeah, I mean, I would expand the question. Um, and But, you know, referring to, especially because we have a small group of people attending, and Natalia just wrote there in the bottom uh, that she, Natalia, you say, you haven't actually observed blatant discrimination, a preference for native speaker over non-native speakers, uh, which is interesting. Um, it's interesting you haven't observed it and you're attending this webinar. <laughs> um, but I think if you if you look at, you know, when schools are marketing courses, and it's quite common for a school to market uh, their courses as saying, you know, we have only native speakers, or we have the most native speakers. And, you know, IH Budapest, International House Budapest, where I, I've uh, taught, and where I've worked for the past 23 years, um, yeah, many, uh, sometime in the 90s actually had a poster that said that, you know, more native speakers than other, any other school. Uh, and it was probably true, and that reflected what the, the marketing people perceived to be a demand of the market. And I think that as a marketing strategy, it, un I say unfortunately, I mean, whatever, unfortunate or unfortunate, it works actually, because it distinguishes a school from other schools. And the, the, the part of the public or the potential customers who haven't yet enrolled in a school or enrolled in that school or walked in the door um, are maybe going to say, aha, oh, well, that, you know, that's what makes it special you know whenever you're you know, it's a business and when you're selling a product you need to have the usps right unique selling points whether it's a school or a course book or whatever you need to be able to say why this is different and having what you know more native speakers than any others is a very concrete um unique selling point to point to it doesn't make you a better school. I'm not saying it's a good policy educationally. I'm saying that, you know, from the point of view of marketing. So 
that you know that question you asked originally, Marek, that you know do most students prefer native speakers? Uh, the, the most students, I think, think they prefer native speakers. Um, I think all students prefer good teachers. You know, and that's um, you know when I was uh, particularly directly involved in recruitment at International House Budapest. Uh, wait, we just Julia just wrote if all school if all schools only hire native speakers, it stops being a USP. Okay, interesting point. This is a comment higher. Yeah, I know you can spell higher, Julia. Over on the right side is the thing. By the way, if it's a question, it, well, you, feel free to write on either side. Okay, um, just to comment on your comment, Julia. It's true. If if everybody starts hiring native speakers, it stops being a USP. But that's not. It's not very easy, actually. Uh, if you're outside of the the UK or the US, you it's. I mean, it's expensive to hire native speakers. Uh, you you don't have that many to choose from locally. Even though obviously there's thousands of native English speakers living in Budapest. USP unique selling point. Sorry, is uh, it's used a lot in marketing, and I'm not going to blob on about marketing, but it's. When you talk about you know selling you know schools who attend schools and how they choose them, it is something to think about. Um, so Julia, to answer that, it, it, it's it's true, but that's just theoretical. It, it you know school, schools can't afford to uh, because they have to um, to hire native speakers and to attract good teachers from outside. They've got to um, provide a level of a uh, service, you could say, or comfort that it, it, it's more, it costs more than hiring somebody locally. You know, somebody locally has got their flat. They already live there. They know the customs. They don't need a lot of support. Um, they know their way around. You hire somebody from outside, but you got to get them a flat, and it better be a nice one, right? You know, so they, they have some kind of standard. Renting flats, you know, especially for an outsider, for a foreigner, is more expensive than for a local blah, 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 the, maybe the salary expectations are different. So, you know, all schools can't do it in a very competitive market. But um, I started to say before, when I was uh, particularly overseeing recruitment in International House Budapest, this is back again in around, you know, late 90s. I can't remember what year. It might have been a little more recent. It might have been in the knots. You know, I've been at the school 23 years, so I lost track. Anyway, we had um, at least seven different nationalities of English teachers, of which, of those seven, only three of those were native English speaker nationalities. So we had Americans, Brits, actually we had one American, lots of Brits and an Australian. Other than that, we had, of course, we had a few Hungarians, a Romanian, a Czech, French woman, and a German. And uh, they were all English teachers. And my attitude was, you know, we don't we don't hire native speakers; we hire good teachers. Period. So can I? Um, yeah. I know I I uh, it's the second question that I'm already asking, but uh, I think if, so. You you said you know um, I don't want to sort of you know take over the webinar, but it just struck me that because you were when you were talking about the USB, the unique selling point, um, but at the same time, you know your you think that most students prefer good teachers rather than, um, let's say, native speakers or non-native. They prefer good teachers. So shouldn't we try to, why, why does being a native speaker um, be a unique, unique selling point rather than something like our school has the best teachers? I don't know. Uh, just yeah, that. no, good question. And I thought about it then that could we come up? Is there a way to, to you know, basically market? Okay. The, the short answer is, it's a lot easier to point to something very simple and quantifiable like more native speakers. So, from a marketing standpoint, if you're trying to attract new customers, good teaching, uh, you know, good quality teaching, good results, whether it's people who uh, feel they. Um, ooh, really good question, Merrick. Yeah, why should it be? All right, <laughs> get to that. Um, uh, no, if, so so getting good results, whether it's good exam results or people being motivated or achieving the level they want, uh, you know, that's what you want. You know, good results and the word of, word about that gets around. It's more about you know reputation. It's hard to market a good reputation. I mean, even the you know companies with the best reputation spend lots of money 
marketing their logo, just making sure it's out there, making sure it's observed. They've all, and they've got a perfectly good product. And you say, well, they've got a good product. Why do they spend any money on marketing? Because that's, you know, that's the way customers are. That's the way all of us are as consumers. We, you know, where do you want to spend your money? You know, bing, something goes into your head. And it's it's got to be something that's distinguished itself in whatever the product is from the other possibilities. So. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm just thinking if perhaps, you know, perhaps we should, uh, I don't know, um, ask somebody in, in marketing who knows a lot about that because maybe since all the schools are selling themselves because they've got native speakers, maybe we can make good teachers a unique selling point. It will be quite unique because there are very few schools, I think, that would sell themselves to having good teachers. Uh, yeah, but they, they won't because nobody would say they don't have good teachers. You know, it's sort of, it's too kind of, you know, you know, everybody says they're the best. Everybody says they're good. But, um, yeah, okay, not, Natalia just wrote over there, uh, the institute I used to work in Rio used highly qualified teachers as a selling point. That's that's good. So I think that, you know, saying, the, you know, high quality, qualified teachers, very experienced teachers, uh, that's, you know, a factor that can play in, in marketing. Um, but you can, if you think about it, it's highly qualified, it's getting more concrete than, you know, great teachers, effective teachers. That starts to get to be like, you know, it's delicious. So, mm. British state schools and universities use results. Yes. Yeah, different kind of um, market. But you know, it would be it would be. Well, actually, you know, language schools do too. So language schools use their uh, exam prep course results. That's something you see a lot. Where you know our pass rate on the intermediate state exam is ninety two percent or something like that, and um, you know students will look at that, and take it seriously. So students looking for um, for exam courses will definitely look for that, which makes sense. So yes, yeah, Julia, I, I know what you mean. It makes more sense than native speakers, absolutely. So I mean, uh, I hope everybody understands that when I'm talking about this, I'm not saying native speakers are, are, are better teachers at all, not, not, not by a long shot. Uh, to the contrary, it has, not, it has nothing to do with the teacher's nationality, how effective they are. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm, I've obser observed thousands of hours of teaching and there's just no correlation between the teacher's mother tongue and how effective they are as a teacher. None. It's a myth. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, you realize that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's, um, do you, um, Anna, Yulia, Natalia, or Lena, do you have any other questions about um, recruitment? Because uh, I've got loads, but I don't want to take over um, the discussion. So, Okay, there's a question, I think, from Natalia. Over there. Mm -hmm. What's recruit? Oh, in the UK. Mm. Uh, yes. Okay. Natalia's question is, what's what's it like in the UK in relation to this? Yeah, it's taken for granted. So it'd be pretty weird for a school in London to say we have more native speakers. In fact, it's the it's a, it's tricky. It's the opposite situation there. Lots of um, non-native speakers. Uh, more and more non-native speakers teach in the UK. So I know lots of Hungarians and Romanians who are teaching English in the UK, and not just low-level classes, they're teaching at all levels. And uh, that is great. Um, and it's great because also we have people go through our teacher training program, which I run, you know, a CELTA program. And uh, non-native speakers come off and they think, you know, oh, we'll never get a job in, you know, outside of Hungary. And I say, not only can you get a job outside of Hungary, you can get a job in the UK. Here are the contacts. So we actually have a support group as well, you know, um, for people who are looking for jobs abroad. Uh, but where it gets into the opposite problem is that uh, where um, a school, and I know this happened at IH London. So I worked at IH London for short stints in teacher training. So I was aware that they they used to have a very big market, I don't know about now, of uh, students coming from certain countries. So let's say, you know, from Japan or something. So where, you know, there'd be, or from, I remember back in the, in the, the early 90s, it was from Italy. 
just floods of students coming into London. They went to London, to Eich London, to learn English uh, because it was marketed to them as sort of the, you know, the English experience come to Eich London. And some of them ended up with teachers who were non-native speakers. Uh, and I know, okay, I, I didn't talk directly to students about that because I was working in teacher training uh, on just on specific courses. But I know from talking to the directors of study uh, that, you know, that students complain. They said, you know, I paid all this money. I came all the way to London, you know, to have the, the British experience. And I've got a, you know, I've got a teacher from Spain or wherever who's teaching me English. And I like her. She's very nice. I don't want to hurt her feelings. But that's not what I paid for. And I paid a lot of money or my father paid a lot of money or whatever it is. So um, that gets to be another another thing and you know when you if, if, for a school director if you're a school director you you know no matter what you believe you have to you have to really work out what your strategy is you know what are you going to do you know when you're you're hiring good teachers in the uk or in the states and some of them are non-native speakers and you know that market perception that people have flown in from overseas they've flown from japan to london to be taught by native speakers uh, and you know Shame on you. That's what you marketed, but there, you, there you you are, and that's that's another problem. And now I'm going to skim over the what's been written. Natalia wrote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, just a comment on on the on the UK. Um, I've worked there a couple of times, and it, I mean, it's by far the sort of it's got by far the the most equal hiring policies in the ELC in all of in any country that I've worked in. Um, it's the most what the most. Equal hiring policies in the EOT, I would say. And uh, funny you mention um, IH London because um, I actually interviewed uh, the current director of studies in IH London. And mm. uh, she told me, we, we were talking about recruitment, and she said uh, that in four years that she's been the director of studies, there's only been four students that refused to have a classes with an, you know, a, a non native speakers. Um, some have come and complained, but uh, they, you know, they've left. Uh, you know, she convinced them, and they, they were quite happy in school. And in comparison to how many students complained about, I don't know, the teacher not giving homework, the teacher being late, um, you know, many other things, it was. It seemed like a very insignificant number. Yeah. No, I think I think attitudes have changed, and like I said, once people get in there, you know, maybe the first day they went, ooh, ooh she's not. English and then you know they forget it like that you know they, they uh, it goes out of their mind so um, Julia said wait a minute I'm just trying to ignore these. yes Julia wrote in Spain they seem to prefer native speaking backpackers and know nothing about grammar funny you mentioned Spain I was just talking to somebody today it was a Hungarian uh, woman who's on one of our courses and she was in Madrid uh, a couple months ago and her Okay, the fact that she is a fantastic teacher and her English is phenomenally good should be irrelevant, but I'll just point it out, those are also true. But even those, those are in a way by the by, but they're, they're true. She walked into a major language school in Madrid uh, to, and met with an HR person, human resources person, who said right away, oh, what's your name? Oh, you're not a native speaker, are you? Well, then you can't apply for a job here. Spain, Madrid. Don't worry, Merrick, I'm on them. I'm going to write to the head of that organization tomorrow morning. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm honestly, this, this is one thing for those of you who are, who are watching on and Julia, Natalia, and Olena, that Merrick, that Merrick and his organization has been really good at is going after uh, employers in, in the EU who are showing preference for native speakers because it's not just wrong, it's also illegal. So. Yeah, and I, I found that we've it's, got it's a very, very powerful argument. Whenever, whenever I've used it, uh, it's usually worked um, pretty well. Um, it would be interesting as well to check what it's like in your countries, in Ukraine, in Brazil, if you have you know access to the, you know, could look it up in, in the law what it says if it says anything. But um, um, we sort of we've been talking about recruitment for the for you know 25 minutes. Shall we uh, move on to teacher training, Steve? Sure. Unless yeah. somebody has other questions about uh, recruitment. No? Okay. Um, so, shall I kick it off again? Or do you have any questions connected to teacher training and uh, native, non native speakers?
That's how he's typing. Yeah, not everybody at once. Wait, <laughs> not really. Okay. Okay. Well, would you rather um, talk about publishing? Is that the case? Okay. You can start. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've got lots of questions. Um, yeah, I do too. I could ask myself questions. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you, you've already mentioned that uh, the you know sort of the L1 doesn't really play um, a difference. Um, you know, it doesn't make a teacher better or, or worse. But I'm I'm more interested in perhaps uh, when I look back at uh, my own experience, um, you know, in Celta and then Delta. Uh, don't get me wrong, Steve. The Delta was fantastic. It was brilliant. Um, but now that I've, I've got really interested in. Uh, no, if you want to do the Delta, go to Budapest. Uh, it, they've got fantastic trainers. It was, it was just brilliant. I'm not selling it. It was really good. But um, what I was thinking now, you know, I'm doing a PhD in native speakers and ELF and everything. And I'm just wondering why ELF as English as lingua franca or the issue of native speakerism never or world English it. I can't remember it coming up as a discussion topic in, in any of the sessions. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I can't recall it. I don't know if it's on the syllabus of the Delta. And I wonder, how, how do you feel about it? Should it be there? Why? Why not? Uh, okay. Um, for one thing, and you know, I'll comment more on ELF in a second. Uh, on the last day of Delta, and maybe not on your Delta, I used to always do and of course, okay, last day of Delta, what does that say about the topic? But anyway, it, since it's not part of the main curriculum, uh, I did a session on World English as, on English as a Lingua Franca. Uh, I brought in some of Jenny Jenkins' research to kind of, and you know, my, um, my goal was basically to broaden teachers' minds about, you know, what, uh, the sort of whose English is it? That's what the session was called, and, you know. You know, uh, it's it's not the property of Americans or, or Brits or anybody. It's it's um, it's a whole different thing, and it it really depends who's using it in what context. Uh, and it well, interestingly, it was a very unpopular session. I don't maybe it's how I presented it. I think people feel last day of the Delta it was too heavy going. Uh, a lot of people said they just didn't feel it was relevant, and maybe I didn't make it relevant. Maybe uh, you know, maybe for them it was. Um, regarding ELF in general being, being um, you know, content, no, regarding ELF in general, never mind being content for teacher training, I think, you know, with all due respect to the, the kind of ELF movement and people working in it, I, and, you know, I, I think it's done a, a service in terms of opening people's minds to the notion of English not being um, the property of any nationality and English having many forms and English being very, very, in terms of, um, uh, the forms that are used, the, you know, in, in, as in grammatical forms and, and lexical forms and, and everything about the nature of English people are using that that's very, uh, that can only be judged relative to the context that it's being used in. Okay. Now the problem for me with ELF, as I understand ELF, is that it's it was trying to identify, um, you know, English as spoken by non-natives, English, English as a, a lingua franca as a type hmm. of English, and I don't. Sorry to jump in here. But it's a common misconception that it's not true, actually. But uh, well, I was thinking, for example, working from you know the, Jenk, the Jenny Jenkins hmm. work on a, a Common Core syllabus for phonology in L, hmm. and where she identified uh, basically the, the, the phonological features that were impediments to comprehension among non-native speakers. And saying, okay, those should be prioritized, and things that are not impediment to comprehension shouldn't be. And it's a different order, you know, than you find in a in a, a conventional order. So that, for me, that's the kind of thing I mean. I mean, if, if it's if it's a common core, to me, it is the same thing as saying there's one kind of well type core is what I mean. Yeah, I, th I think in here, I think what what she was trying. Um, no, in, if we look at elf sort of publications, they you know nobody says it's um, it's a variety like Indian English or I don't know um, Chinese English um, because it's too varied to be a variety and too changeable depending on the setting. But I think what they're trying to draw attention to is is partly what you said that English doesn't belong to anybody and also that um, there are certain features of um, let's say pronunciation. Um, that 
are necessary for intelligibility. And I think that's the key point as well, intelligibility rather than imitating native speaker models. I think. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the, the idea that imitating native speaker models is it's kind of, so I um, agree that setting native speakerism as a kind of a standard or as a goal is, is actually irrelevant to quite, it's probably the, the majority of people learning English. Uh, it's, it's, it's just that I don't see that ELF offers an alternative that is, uh, it, it can be gracefully brought into either course books or teacher training courses. So, you know, uh, I say, yeah, definitely on teacher training courses, open the discussion, um, broaden people's minds in terms of, you know, English is not the, pro the property of any, any country. And you'd be surprised, you know, on a Celta or a Delta, when you, you um, confront uh, English teachers, and I can say in my experience, it's been especially Brits um, with, you know, with that notion and with concrete forms that are considered acceptable in other contexts, they say, yes, but that's wrong. That's not English. They say, well, you know, I mean, even they'll say even about American English, which is, is uh, you know, all right, fine. Um, so, you know, so teachers need to really, you know, be brought to task about that and, and broaden their minds. But I think the most important, you know, the goal really has to be that you look at what the context is that your learners are going to use English in and what the motivation is, what the reason is, and you teach according to that. Um, that's all. So it, it could be that native speakerism or native speaker forms aren't relevant to them. So that doesn't have to be, you know, featured, you know, when it comes to teaching. Uh, with teacher training is tricky because, you know, in CELTA you're preparing pe people who are going to go off and teach you know, all over the world, and who knows where they're going to teach. Uh, it's, it's very cumbersome with all that you're introducing on a CELTA course, particularly in terms of, you know, methodology and language awareness, to bring this in. You know, people, I think it basically would go, you know, over people, most people's heads. Sort of like recommended post-course reading or something like that, you know. John just yeah, wrote some. I, I mean, personally, you know, as a, as a non-native speaker, I think, I think I would have benefited. I would have been better prepared to stand up to employers had I known um, or had I been explained what I know now about, you know, sort of the native speaker fallacy that, you know, what are the arguments, you know, that I could use, you know, that, you know, your L1 doesn't make you better teachers. Those things, just putting it out on the table and kind of discussing it, you know, um, but yeah. But yeah. No, that's that's There's an interesting good, point I, from John, I think. Yeah, no, and I just want to comment what you said, um, Mary, because that, that's a really good bit of feedback because you've just identified concretely how a teacher can be, can benefit from it in terms of, especially non-native speaker teacher, that it equips you better, you know, the awareness equips you better to deal with what you're going to run into when you go out looking for jobs and you're talking to an employer. Yes, John's got a comment there. Uh huh. Trainees, okay. No discussion of switching to EFL curriculum. Trainees should have strong foundation in English, British, American, both. Yeah, but et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's basically what's happened here, you know, in, in, in Budapest. Um, the you know, it's so much influenced by the, the, the materials you use. And I know we're going to talk about materials in a bit, but if, if you know, British published materials are dominant here in, in Hungary. And so on a CELTA or in teacher training and in English classes, it's British English that's going to dominate. And it's something I know, you know, I did my, my CELTA, it was CTEF at the time, 1990 at IH London. And as an American then, and even to this day, it's, uh, well, it's let's just say it's really interesting the extent to which my English is handled as a secondary form of English uh, in contexts where British English dominates. So, so here in the UK, but when I when I taught in Japan, it was the other way around. It was all Americans and Canadians, and we had I remember there was one British woman on the staff uh, named Estella, and um people you know all the, the american teachers were sort of 
you know, um, sort of di you know, made disparaging comments about her English. It was sort of done in good fun kind of thing. It wasn't done as towards me like my English is wrong. But you know, there is this attitude even among native speakers, who's more native than the other. Hmm. But do you think, just to finish off this sort of question that I asked, do you think um, those issues will um, become part of the, the CELTA Delta curriculum or not really? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's worth, it's almost, it's worth putting forth, except I wouldn't personally, I, th I think, it, you know, it's got to be, I think I think it's almost the angle's different because it has to be different because you know we get um, we always have mixed groups on our celtas so it's always hung, you know Hungarians Brits um, fewer Americans these days because of employment in the EU being difficult uh, you know and that might be why the people would come here uh, we always have some Romanians and Russians sometimes Serbs so people in the region anyway we always we occasionally or often encounter attitudes. Uh, on the part of native speakers towards non-native speakers, so a, lo a low tolerance towards, um, you know, issues of accuracy. So when a, uh, and this will come up in written feedback sometimes that a native uh, speaker, CELTA trainee will comment um, in writing on the accuracy issues of their non-native speaking fellow trainee, as you know, how can this person teach English? And, uh, and, you know, that indicates, well, actually, when that happens, we, we do confront it head on. You know, we don't, we don't tolerate intolerance, you could say. Um, but it does indicate that it should be addressed maybe more formally, you know, as in with a session somewhere. Again, where do you fit it in? Yeah. And we've just been joined by one of our, my colleagues in IH Budapest, Susie Coates, who's one of the CELTA trainees, so, trainers, sorry, hi. So if I say anything that, about what we do in Budapest that's not true, she'll jump in and say, oh, no, 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 no. Anyway. Yeah. Um, um, Natalia has a, had a comment over there on the right, which is a, a really good point. With teacher training, the problem is accepting and incorporating local knowledge in a way an internationally standardized course might not be ready to. I mean, you've just said it perfectly. That's, that's it, is that, you know, if the, the the goal of, or if the goal of um, world, you know, building awareness of world English is makes people appreciate more the importance of understanding the context in which English is used, uh, the local context, um, and that informs teacher training courses too much. You might end up with trainee teachers who are experts in a very narrow context, or seen, or are perceived as such. So that's a that's a, a danger. That's a trick. So, thank you for that comment, Natalia. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, just to comment on what John said about Belgium. I mean, in Poland, at least when I went to university, which wasn't such a long time ago, um, yeah, it was all about you had to choose it, and it was either British or American English that you had to learn, and you were only a successful learner as long as you um, were able to. Well, the more closely you were able to imitate that model, the more successful learner in their eyes you were, uh, which I now think is a very skewed perspective. And I mean, the, the issue of world Englishes didn't come up at all in three years of you know doing English um, and philology in a university, which I think is is bizarre, really. Um, I know it's you know it's a new research, it's a new sort of paradigm, but. Uh, it is interesting that it doesn't come up there as well. It is, yeah, absolutely. I well, you know, you're talking a lot about it. You have to, you know, that now you have to adopt whatever world English is approach. But I think just putting the issue on the table, right, for discussion, and then, you know, the teachers can just raising awareness, really, isn't it? Yeah, that it's it's there. That it's it's an issue. It's a topic. They should think about it. Uh, they should reflect on their attitude and not just you know have a, a knee jerk re un uninformed knee jerk reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, are there any other questions about teacher training, or should we move on to uh, publishing and materials writing? If you can maybe type in in the chat box whether you 
you'd like us to continue um, talking about recruit, uh, teacher training, or shall we move on to materials? Okay, you'll get some materials. Okay. Do you have any questions or shall I kick it off again? Uh, please ask questions, ask, ask something, please. No questions, okay. No problem. Merrick right. has questions. Yeah. <laughs> there are lots of questions. I've been thinking about it. That's, that's my only occupation at the moment, thinking and reading. That's what you do. And, you and coming up with reading. questions, yeah. I've got a lot of questions. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, so we were, I mean, I'll just ask the same question that I asked you before about cells and delta, but we'll put um, materials instead of cells and delta. So should English as a lingua franca, non-native speaker models, um, world Englishes, should they feature more prominently in course books? Um, or do they actually now? Um, is there more of a sort of, you know, move away from um, only British or American models in course books? Uh, there is definitely a change. Sorry, I'm pausing now because I can see there was some typing going on and I'm waiting for this things to come through anyway. But meanwhile, I'll, I'll answer that. I mean, when you say, uh, you know, models, so language models, uh, language appears in, in a course book. Uh, let's say English appears in a course book in many, many ways. Uh, you know, it appears on the page, you know, through, you know, of course, through instructions, um, you know, the rubrics. It appears in texts. Uh, it appears in, in um, listening extracts and video extracts and in the tape scripts of those. Um, and in, it appears in, you know, grammar sections where that's where you have what I might, if somebody talks about a model, that's what I would refer to as a model. So that's the language that, you know, for that lesson uh, is being offered up as the thing, you know, this is the thing that we're learning today. You might learn lots of things, there's lots of material here, but this is basically the, you know, the target language or something like that. Uh, I, um, I don't see World English, you know, I don't even know what a World English model would be of, you know, if, you, if you're teaching a particular grammatical area and if somebody wants to suggest one, just take a gr grammar area and say, okay, what would be a world English model of language in this section? And in fact, you know, as, as the only American among four authors of a British published course book, uh, I, you know, I mean, I had, you know, my editor, well, my co-writer and my editor had to, you know, correct my English. So I was, you know, I, on one hand, I was the, well, you know, because it was in British publishing, if there ever is an American speak out, and there may be one day, they're going to go through it and Americanize all the all the grammar and the lexis. But for now, you know, they, they anchor it in British English. There's sometimes comments, you know, you see in the grammar section in America, in the U.S., sometimes they say it like this, or uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get that, but it's minimized. So, you know, even getting away from British English or British public course book is tricky to actually have models in, in you know, reflecting another English, I just, I don't see it happening. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I can, I can sp speak for Speak Out in particular. Speak Out is, you know, one of its USPs is a, a very high quantity of authentic material, authentic language, including BBC videos and these, something called BBC uh, interviews that are man on the street interviews. They're called, you know, we used to call them podcasts. Uh, where you know we had a BBC crew go around London and ask people questions, um, and we didn't tell the people that it was for a language book. It's just that the questions that were geared to be used with the lower with the starter book um, were simpler, like you know, uh, you know what what do you do at the weekend, or you know where do you shop, or something like that. And then higher and higher levels, more complex questions. And in every unit or every lesson, actually, there's a set of or every unit there's a set of these interviews. Now, since the BBC crew was just walking around central London, um, they, I lost count of the nationalities. Um, the, you know, I mean, if you couldn't have a wider representation of world Englishes than you have in those interviews, and also for the BBC videos, so there's a, a you know, a DVD, a lesson that's built from a BBC uh, program, and this wasn't all, you know, BBC costume drama kind of thing, it was BBC World, uh, so we were drawing on a much wider 
kind of you know archive. Um, so you know, for example, the, the we have in three of the levels we have a program that's hosted by an Italian um, architect, or he's an, he's an art historian TV presenter named Francesco Francesco de, Mo, de Mosto, I think is his whole name, and his his English would never be mistaken for any anywhere near native. Um, he's wonderful, but he's there, and now with all those you know all that non-native English. We've never had a single user comment negatively. They love Francesco. They love the, the, these, um, these interviews, uh, partly because I suppose they can identify with a lot of the, the speakers as models. So you get these, you know, you get these sort of montages of different people answering the same question. You've got Brits, Americans, Chinese, Italians. You've got people who are native people, speaker, people who are struggling to get through a sentence. Um, and we used the whole the whole range, and and um, and absolutely there was no issue. We didn't we didn't have a meeting and saying, oh geez, this is really revolutionary. Should we do it? Let's go for it. No, we you know it was just it was good material. We could see it was attractive attractive material. We had teachers tried it out, students ate it up, and we said, okay, good. You know, we we you know very simple concepts, but but um, you know people like it. So I think I think in terms of the language content, so you can call those models, it's changed a lot. Yeah, I mean, I can't. I don't know. Perhaps true of other courses as well. I know. I know. Speak out better than others, naturally. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I know speak out pretty well because I, I taught for a while from it um, for a year maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, I think other ones that I've used are face to face, New English file, perhaps because they are older. Um, it's mostly, I think, native speaker models. But yeah, I, you know, speak out has those videos, and as you say, they just feature. You know, it's like. A well in you know in one place because it's London, right? So the future everybody. Yeah. Um, Julie asked a question. There it is. It's put in why students are learning English, adapt lessons accordingly, which is, you know, absolutely it's a lot of work. Uh, also we choose course book depending on students' needs where possible. I mean you, you, usually when you work in a language school, they say this is the book we use. At this level, um, and then you, you know, I, you know, I don't actually have a, a huge problem with that personally because it, you know the the number of hours teachers teach these days to basically okay here's the book work with this, um, and to me that says anchor in this because uh, and I like having an anchor and students like having an anchor, but then once you find out more about your students what they're interested in why they're learning English you you know you supplement from sources that are going to to help them in those areas. Um, so, I mean, ho hopefully the course book that is foisted upon you is actually, you know, relatively attractive to students and relevant to their needs. I mean, above all that it suits their level, you know, um, but also in terms of approach and interests that it's compatible. So. Yeah, Natalia said that in school in Brazil, they, they developed uh, uh, their own materials um, for Brazil only, uh, with mostly Brazilian speakers, well, Brazilian speaking English, right? Yeah. Very interesting idea. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, because I know that the question might come up. You might ask so the, the, about, um, you know, if you look at major course book series, at least that are used in Europe, that are British published, all the people writing them are by and large Brits, except me. But um, <laughs> I don't know the nationality. Okay, there's a major, there's a major ad adult course books. Um, but if you look at in, you know, there's a huge local um, course book market as in, in individual countries and, you know, a huge country like Brazil, I mean, it's massive. You know, any British publisher would, would, you know, love to get in there into that market, you know, from a business point, business point of view. But in in um, every country, in particularly larger countries, there's a, a, a real demand for material that's geared for the local market, and it doesn't even necessarily having the local language in it. It's just in terms of the the topics, the models, as you say, Natalia. You know that that you know, and you know, having the sense of humor. You know, that, what a good point. That's that one thing as a course book writer that uh, and as a person who likes who thinks humor is most important. One thing that that they almost don't let you get in there is, or that there's a lot of resistance to is humor because humor is not, um, 
humor is only international in that everybody likes to laugh, but what makes people laugh is so different. So, you know, Brazil, Brazilian sense of humor, um, you know, I maybe I wouldn't get it, but great for the local market. So there are um, lots and lots of non-native English speaking authors, very successful ones in regional course book writing, as well as, by the way, as well as in um, course books for younger learners and up through uh, through teens. And I mean mainstream, you know, there's, I think there's, uh, I actually went through an enlisted because I thought it might come up, but there's, I, you know, I found six right off kind of in a quick pass, uh, you know, Turkish, Argentinian, Spanish, German, and Greek, and I can say their names, but they have written major uh, course books for uh, either very young learners, young learners, or teens. So, uh, but it's, it's true that in the, in the adult, in the adult course book market, the kind of mainstream market, it's not. I, I couldn't find anybody, any non-native speakers. And if you want to ask me why, I don't. I wouldn't know how to answer that. So, hmm. wait. Natalia's got a comment there. Nobody talked about elf. Yeah, elf is kind of a new thing. You know, not that new, but yeah. I mean, it's it's only the last sort of the research started one um, fifteen years ago, maybe. Um, Know, sort of in the late 90s, early 2000s, so it is. Um, yeah, but I, yeah. I had that, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I had the same too. Well, I think I, yeah, um, yeah, good point, Olin, about English humor. I mean, humor is generally difficult to translate, period, or to, it doesn't necessarily travel well. Uh, and Natalia mentioning that you, um, when you moved to Australia, struggling to communicate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, until you have, until you've sort of, you know, bathed in the context of the, the, the sounds, basically the sound systems that you need to be able to understand, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. So if, you, if the models you were exposed to in Brazil tended to be either, you know, Brazil accented or some kind of, you know, neutralized North American English, you said it was um, American English. So it's probably not just American English, but these, you know, course book uh, material is often the studio recorded stuff tends to be a bit um you know neutralized in terms of uh uh authenticity i mean it's something it's a real battle you know that that a course book producer or writer has uh, in the process is trying to write and record material that actually sounds authentic so that's another yeah. thing but that's that's I why guess. i think you know those those course books like speak out that have those natural Videos. I mean, my students loved it. Like, you know, I had complete beginners, and they can, I don't know, they just see the video, and it's it's natural English. You can see that it's not set up for language learners. It's just an interview with random people yeah. in London, yeah. and it's it's great. It adds authenticity to it because, yeah, as you said, a typical recording in a course book is very well um, artificial. Or, you know, yeah, very, yeah. Very, yeah, it's yeah, yeah it, it is, and I don't know if this is maybe drifting slightly from the topic, but it might be interesting to people that when you, you know, um, I mean, even for, for speaker with all the, you know, the the value put on authenticity, we do have scripted material in places, and um, you know, we script it and we edit it and we re-edit it and try to make it authentic, you know, and you know, often I did this by actually getting people to do a conversation and recording it, you know, giving them the topic and taking extracts from that instead of just making up them out of my head. And we work really hard at, at that. And then you go in the studio and uh, the actors who are hired for recording um, are often uh, actors who, who are, they're sort of like TEFL actors. So you can hear their voices on all different courses, right? And they're, they're hired because they're, this is their line of work. And the trouble is, is they've got that kind of TEFL studio style and voice and you're like no 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 can you just do it like you're you okay just forget that you're an actor just please you've got a great voice just don't act okay and you can't tell uh, no the thing is we weren't allowed to speak directly to the actors so i didn't but if i had been i would have uh, you can't do that with actors you can't say don't act but it was really tempting and that was that was a struggle and you know it has to do with you know what happens when you get actors and one solution we had was to do something called semi-scripting where we would either give a topic or we'd give even just give a task to people 
And uh, this is more in the second edition. This features quite a lot, where we we would give the actors a task to do or a topic or something to work out, almost like in task-based learning, and record it. And we'd end up with you know maybe just sort of ten minutes, and then you would go through and and cut it down to the length we needed, which is often something in the two-minute range. Because and but it the language is so much more authentic because they weren't reading a script and they managed to forget that even that they were actors after a bit, they got engaged in the topic, at least most of them did. So that's a, um, a question from Susie, um, Susie Coates. Okay. See. I can't see it. Wait a minute. I think I pressed some wrong thing on the question thing. Hold on. Show all questions. There it is. Whoops. Show open questions. Yeah. Do you think this way of empowering local non-native speaker teachers in an international course book? And to, they don't mean, seem to be portrayed much in course books. Do you mean that non-native speaker teachers aren't portrayed much in course books or non-native speakers aren't portrayed much in course books? Sorry, I just want to make sure. It, the question, Julia, it's down center pane. Yeah. That, yeah, Marek wrote below the videos. You might have to scroll up or pull up the pane. Okay, so Susie, do you mean uh, by they? Do you mean non-native speakers or non-native speaker teachers? I think you mean non-native speakers. Am I being dopey here? Okay, you're writing over in the comments thing. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's probably changed now, but uh, um, in 2000, um, uh, Vivian Cook wrote uh, that. Uh, the way non-native speakers non-native speakers are presented basically in two ways in course books. They're either um, well, they're either struggling to communicate anything with their limited English, or they are yeah. students in a university or in a classroom talking to each other with yeah. limited English. Yeah, language travelers trying to buy the ticket. Yeah, yeah. I know um, it's you know it was back in two thousand, so it might have changed, but. Um, I thought I would bring it in. Um, looking at that. No, it's only cha it's you know, it's changed. I'm, Susie, I'm watching for your clarification there. But to this, it might this might actually answer the question. Uh, okay, it's changed to the extent in a way that I described. For example, in Speak Up, you've got all these, you know, uh, particularly in videos and also in recordings, you have quite a lot of non-native speakers who aren't presented as the non-native speakers. They're presented as human beings who are using English to communicate meaning. Uh, you know, the host of a, a BBC TV show isn't there because he's a non-native speaker, you know, to the, and he happens to be Italian. But um, uh, in terms of um, what you're talking about, Merrick, sort of, the, you know, which I, I've seen called the, you know, the presented as language travelers. So when you get functional language lessons, and it's especially lower levels, travel English, and or you're teaching, um, you know, what's called strategic language, you know, language used to clarify meaning or uh, you know, to deal with breakdowns in understanding. Now, the breakdown in understanding can happen between native speakers, uh, but native speakers generally deal with it in a different way than you might um, teach, particularly lower level uh, learners to do. And, the way, and you, you have different expectations. So uh, it was very tricky for us in, in you know, so in Speak Out, the third lesson in every unit is kind of functional language at lower levels. It tends to be either travel English or um, a lot of strategic language that I'm talking about. And um, we, you know, if, if you've got a native speaker going in a train station and they're buying a ticket and you want to model for students what to do when you're buying the ticket and, you know, classic situation, you don't know what the person behind the window says. So you say, can you repeat that, please? You know, uh, sorry, how much did you say? No, I didn't catch that. No, we do that because you can't hear through those windows. Um, but if you're modeling that for low levels, the native speaker model doesn't work. Uh, it's too uh, it's too brisk. If it's natural, it's too brisk. It's too offhand. And the model that an, a low level, an elementary learner is going to identify with is an elementary-ish level, maybe pre-intermediate level traveler, speaker. So there you've got your language traveler. Now, what's really interesting is that when you have these kind of lessons, so you've got the, the recording between the native speaker ticket seller and the non-native speaker elementary level traveler and, you know, um, 
who unfortunately sometimes that was the other thing I was going to say for recording is sometimes an actor who's British who's imitating an accent. Okay, because when you're going to have six accents in your book and you we you know we try to cover a range of accents, it's written there in the brief. You can't hire an actor from different you know from six different countries. It's too expensive. You can't have you know a Chinese, a Japanese, a Spanish, uh, an Italian, and a Hungarian and a Polish actor standing there waiting to do their their dialogue. So you you need to hire actors who are actually good with different accents. Anyway, so in these lessons, you have the, the recordings that have the non-native speaker and this language traveler, but then you have the section where you isolate the exponents, right? Could you repeat that, please? And one debate came up between us is, okay, when you're actually isolating the exponent, is the model, because that's the model, you know, that goes to a repeat after me stage. What's the model? Is it the elementary level, you know? Act, actor speaker from the, the recording, or is it native speaker? Um, we went for a native speaker model. So when it was the at the repeat after me stage, it was native speaker rather than the actor after doing the Spanish accent. So it was a yeah. bit of a debate. Susie, you still haven't clarified what you meant, but um, or at least it hasn't come up. I hate to interrupt, but um, we'll probably have to be finishing very soon because it's already um, okay. um, it's been an hour. But uh, if you you know um, if you still have any questions, please um, type them in. Um, but uh, before we go again, I just want to thank John and and Delta for doing the you know the webinars and and thanks Steve as well for you know taking an hour off your. Um, Sunday okay. afternoon. I'm sure there are many better things to do than um, the no, webinar. No, this is Sunday the best afternoon. thing to do. This, this is the best <laughs> thing to do on Sunday afternoon. That was the only correct answer in this situation, I think. Uh, but uh, it was very interesting, and um, we could um, go on chatting about it for a very, very long time, I think. We could. Yes, yeah. thank you, Merrick. And I'm going to actually write to the wait, uh, correct way to spell speak out is speak out it's one word everybody you know there's even okay. marketing people at, at Pearson who spell it the way you do you do mark Merrick in fact more people spell it the way you do than spell it the way it's supposed to be oh, really? but, uh, okay yeah okay. so yeah and uh, yeah I'm you can uh, this video will be um, available on YouTube so um, um, please feel free to, to share it um, with other people and uh, yes yeah, stay tuned we'll have more webinars coming uh, next year as well um so so yeah there'll be there'll be a lot of discussion about uh elf native speakers non-native speakers and different things but uh but yeah thanks again steve i thought it was it was thank it was you